Let us continue reading this book by J.A. Wiley, The Jesuits. We are now reading chapter 13. The intrigues of the Jesuits under James I and Charles I. Our Father in heaven, bless the reading of your work, of your word today through this book, I pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. The scepter now passed from the house of Tudor to the house of Stuart. But there came no pause in the machinations of the Jesuits. Under the Stuart, they continued to ply as adeciously as ever their arts for embroiling the kingdom and accomplishing the ruin of the Reformation in Great Britain, which, as matters then stood, would have been its destruction all over Christendom. It is true they now began to hatch seditions and treasons in Scotland, as for a long while before they had done in Ireland. But the center of the web they were so busily engaged in weaving was England. There the leading just there the leading conspirators borrow, borrowed in the great cities. The Jesuits of the day thought to carry the three kingdoms at a stroke. They had not been they have not then learned that they were aiming at too much at once, that their true policy was to be content meanwhile with one of the kingdoms, and having secured that one, they would be sure of the other two. In a word, they did not yet understand that the road to the throne and government of England lay through Ireland. Proceeding on this idea, that is, of carrying England by a code de main, they, they strove by devices of one kind or another to prevent James ascending, to, ascending the throne of England. Failing in this, they, they next attempted to destroy him, and not the king only. With the monarch were doomed to perish, the two houses of parliament, when this project, the gigantic wickedness of which astounded all men, fell through other snares, less violent but no less but not less deadly, were spread around King James. He was now invingled into negotiations for the marriage of his son with Infanta of Spain. No king of England in our day would be greatly lifted up by the prospect of such an alliance. It was different then. James was dazzled by it, and he sacrificed for it in the interest of his daughter and son-in-law in the Palatinate, an act of egregious folly which drew after it the temporary overthrow of liberty and the reformed religion in Germany. The proposed, match, the proposed match ultimately came to nothing, but not till concessions had been obtained from King James, which opened the door for a vast influx of priests and Jesuits into the kingdom in a very considerable accession of influence to the Church of Rome in England. The prospect of a French match is as well as is well known, followed hard upon the breaking of the Spanish one. This negotiation prospered, that is, as the king judged of it, but as history has since seen cause to view it, its success was one of the greatest calamities that ever befell the three kingdoms, inaugurating as it did a series of evils which ended in the all but total ruin of Great Britain. Before the hand of Henrietta of France could be put into that of the son of James VI, the English monarch had to renew all the concessions to the Church of Rome, which he had been willing to make in prospect of the Spanish marriage. The negotiations were concluded and the marriage arranged with James VI suddenly died. It does not surprise us that the unexpected demise of one who was not much past the prime of life and who will then till then had enjoyed good health occurring at the moment when it was so handy for the Jesuit, brought on the fathers a suspicion that they had hastened the king's demise in order that his more popishly inclined son might come sooner to the throne. We'll read the next paragraph the next time. May God our Father continue to bless you and his only begotten divine Son, Jesus Christ, be gracious to you now and forever.